<laughs> Thank you. It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Temiskaming Clarkton. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, according to the independent watchdog called Polymeter, the Premier kept just 37 per cent of his promises over the last four years. Now, when I came home from school with a 37 per cent <laughs> mark on a test, uh, it wasn't a very proud day for me. So when it comes to public health care, instead of fixing hallway medicine left to the Premier by the Liberals, things actually got worse. Wait times for Ontarians and hospitals have grown for vital surgeries and procedures. Hospitals that were over capacity even before the pandemic. Why did the Premier break his promise to Ontarians, the promise he made to end hallway health care? To reply, Government House Leader, Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That is really, really rich coming from the member opposite because he has voted against every single measure that we have done to improve health care. Now, he voted against, he voted against building 58,000 new and upgraded long-term care beds. He voted against adding 27,000 additional health care workers in our long-term care homes. He has voted against the, mo the most massive rebuild of health care in provincial history. We're building new hospitals in Niagara. Voted against it. A brand new hospital for Brampton. You know what he did? He voted against it. A new hospital, the largest hospital in Peel region, Order. voted against it. In Ottawa, voted against it. Every single measure that we have done to improve health care, he voted against it. And to make matters worse, colleague, when his power held when his party held the balance of power and could have ended the misery that was the Response. previous Liberal government, what did they ask? Nothing. Nothing. They ask for nothing, Mr. Speaker. People know a strong, stable, progressive, conservative majority gets it done. Thank you, Speaker. You didn't really hear an answer in that. The Premier also promised to reduce how long Ontarians would wait in ERs. But all this hallway medicine has meant emergency room wait times actually grew longer under his watch. In June 2018, the average wait was 14 hours in the hospital. Even before the pandemic, under this government's watch, before the pandemic, it's 16 hours. Yeah. So why hasn't the government actually reduced ER wait times in hospital in their four years? Invest the money. Government House Leader. What, are, what would have really been helpful, Mr. Speaker, is when the NDP held the balance of power between 2011 and 14, had they done the right thing and voted the Liberals out of office so that we could have started rebuilding health care then, Mr. Speaker. That's what if it would have been the right thing. So we have started right from the very beginning. Now, the member for Scarborough Asian Court talked about emergency rooms. You know what he got? He got a brand new emergency room for his community, Mr. Speaker. But we didn't stop there. Because although they voted against that, we didn't stop there. We knew that Scarborough hospitals needed to have support. They voted against it. The previous Liberal government did nothing. Yeah. Our Premier, our Minister of Health, this caucus, our Scarborough team, a billion dollars for health care in Scarborough. Yeah. Now, it's no boy. I mean, you can build all the buildings you want. You can build all the facilities that you want. But if you don't put Nurse. nurses in those facilities, Pops. there's no point. We're, build, we're putting nurses in facilities. New, new medical uh, set schools so that we can have, wait for it, more doctors to work in all of these brand new hospitals. Thank you. The final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Order. From inside, come the to order. Premier, the Premier promised he'd build more long-term beds. Order. Beds that should be staffed. Order. A bed by itself without staffing isn't a bed. And in their 15 years of power, the Liberals only built 611. But the Financial Accountability Officer says that this government, the PCs, are years behind their own schedule, behind their own promise to build these beds, and won't have enough staff to support them. Nope. Speaker, what matters more than words is results. Results matter. Why is this government not keeping their promise to improve long-term care in Ontario? Minister of Long-Term Care. 
I, I, I'm not sure if the member, he must be embarrassed. I don't know why his leader is making him ask these questions, Mr. Speaker, because we've added 58,000 new and upgraded beds in every part of the province, north, south, east, west, urban and rural. We are adding long-term care beds. He talks about the staff. We're adding 27,000 additional health care workers. Now, wait for it, colleagues. The NDP put a proposal for it on long-term care. They want to get rid of 17,000. We're saying 27,000. They only want to hire 10, 10,000. They want it before we've even hired them. They want to lay off 17,000 PSWs. Order. They don't want to build long-term care, colleagues. They want to buy real estate. That Order. is the big plan of the NDP and the Liberals. So while we're building long-term care all Order. over the province, an $11 billion investment. You know what that is, Speaker? The largest Response? investment in Canadian history in long-term care. Speaker, that's what we've done, and that's unfortunately what you voted against every single time. Even beds in his own riding, he voted against. Order. The next question, the member for Timiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. The PCs, when they got elected, also made promises, or before they got elected, about the cost of living, but haven't Order. fixed those problems either. They promised, they promised to reduce the cost of hydro to consumers, and they even had a number, 12%. Vote for us, and we're going to take your hydro bills down 12%. First, we couldn't figure out where they got the number, but now they've even told the Financial Accountability Office they have no intention to lower electricity bills by 12% from 2018, even though that was their promise. Why did the government break their promise to lower consumer hydro bills by 12 percent. Minister of Energy to reply. Mr. Speaker, I am so pleased to get this question this morning. Thank you to the member opposite for the question. What the Financial Accountability Officer actually uh, said in his report the other day, that we're on pace to reduce electricity prices from the Liberals' unfair hydro plan by 12 per cent next year and by 23 per cent by the end of the decade, Mr. Speaker. What we have brought to electricity customers in the province is stability, and that's why we're seeing the type of investment that we're seeing in this province. The Liberals ran 350,000 manufacturing jobs south of the border or overseas. What we've seen since we got our electricity prices under control in Ontario is massive order. investment in our province, Mr. Order. Speaker. Billion-dollar investments in LG Stellantis's battery plant down in Windsor, thanks to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, and our Premier Premier. Response. Massive billion-dollar investments in electric vehicle manufacturing platforms in locations across the province. Mr. What Ontarians have seen is massive speeches about dropping the price of electricity, but I don't think they saw their electricity prices drop by 12 percent. The PCs also said they would fix the cost of buying a home by increasing affordable housing, but they didn't. Under this government's watch, buying a home is twice as expensive as it was in 2018. And since 2018, the average cost of a rental home is up 192 bucks a month. Instead of being laser focused on fixing the housing crisis, the Premier again is breaking his promise to build affordable housing. Why, instead of fixing the crisis, did he make it worse? Yeah. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. To Speaker, I, I'm actually not going to thank the member for the question because <laughs> Ontarians uh, certainly don't owe your party any thanks. Every measure that our government has done since we set foot in this legislature four years ago has been to help the housing supply crisis. It's been to help protect uh, people who are in uh, rental housing. It's to support municipalities and grow community housing. Each and every time, Speaker, we always know what New Democrats do. They always vote no. They always obstruct. You know, sp Speaker, I don't think uh, we're going to ever see a New Democrat can a campaign on standing up for that person who wants to realize the dream of home ownership. We've, we've passed 79 bills in this House, Speaker, yep. since we became government. Eight of them have been mine. Every single time, the NDP has tried to obstruct someone wanting Response. to realize the dream of home ownership. Shame on that member. Shame, Shame on her leader, Andrew Horvath, the queen of no. Shame on the NDP. Okay. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. 
first of all, I'll remind members, perhaps one last time, that we refer to each other either by our writing name or our ministerial title or perhaps Leader of the Official Opposition, not by their personal names. But I'm, up, I'm actually going to ask the minister to withdraw. Okay. Order. <laughs> Order. Order. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Thank you. The PCs might have campaigned on these promises four years ago, but Ontarians, Ontarians haven't seen the results. They didn't get a government that made life more affordable. They talk about it, but they didn't do it especially when people's hydro bills and housing costs skyrocketed over the last four years. And they didn't get a government that kept their promises because the PCs only kept 37% of them. Two out of three, almost two out of the three things they said didn't happen. Ontarians need a government that will fix what's broken. Why has it been so hard for this government to simply do what you said you would do? And the government has <laughs> Speaker, I think when you go around the province and you speak to the people of the province of, of Ontario, they will tell you that this government has done more for the people of the province of Ontario than any government in generations, Mr. Speaker. So let's talk about what we got done. So the first thing that we did is that we removed the most vulnerable people from paying taxes. Imagine, they had the balance of power. They could have said, let's take the most vulnerable off of the tax rolls. They didn't do it. The lift tax credit, we got it done, Mr. Speaker. We knew we had to get people moving around the province. So you know what we did? We built transit and transportation, roads, Mr. Speaker, subways. They couldn't get it done. We're getting it done, Mr. Speaker. They jobs, thousands of jobs. We all remember the economy. It was a mess under the coalition of no, Mr. Order. Speaker. We brought back 500,000 jobs for the province of Ontario. And you know what? There is over 300,000 jobs that we need to fill, Mr. Speaker, because of the hard work of a strong, stable, progressive, conservative majority government. And after June the 2nd, a strong, stable, progressive, conservative government. Thank you. The next question, Stop the clock. Members will take their seats. Order. 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 I assume everyone wants to come into the chamber at four o'clock this afternoon. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier, but clearly the members on that side of the House haven't been knocking on me very many doors in the province of Ontario. Order. So the, the government has broken so many promises, Speaker. It's hard to keep track. They did keep one, however, and that was cutting the services that Ontarians rely on. In fact, it was cuts across the board for this government. Cuts to libraries, to legal aid, to Indigenous culture fund, and even cuts to the innovative IT sector in Waterloo Region, which creates jobs in the province. But when it came to their 20 per cent income tax cut that the PCs promised to bring in in their third year, they just didn't do it. You can chalk it up to just one more broken promise from this Premier and from this PC government. Why did this government refuse to do the very things that they said they would do, including this very Question. specific campaign promise for a tax cut? What are you going to say to the people now? Thank you. Government House Leader. The, the NDP will go out there and campaign, and they'll say that they're for the little guy, right? But when we brought a proposal forward that would remove the lowest income earners from paying taxes, the responsibility of paying taxes, so that they could get a helping hand and contribute even more to the economy, more to their family, you know what they did? 
They voted against it. When we reduced Order. premiums, WSIB premiums, for our small business owners by $2.5 billion on the route to increasing support Order. for injured workers, they voted against it. When we cut red tape and job-killing regulation, they wanted more. We got rid of it, and that's why we are bringing back thousands of jobs, Mr. Speaker, in the province of Ontario. When the Minister of Energy cut hydro rates and cancelled the 19 percent increase that the Liberals wanted to bring in, they voted against it. They actually wanted to keep a carbon tax and fought so hard for cap and trade in the province of Ontario. And then they went to the Ottawa and said, put it back on the people. We cut tolls, we cut license plate fees. We're making life more affordable because a strong, stable, progressive conservative majority. Stop the clock again. Okay. So the outbursts are continuing. I realize there's a lot of excitement in the House this morning, and I understand the reason. But we're going to get through question period. And um, I'm going to start calling people out by name, by writing name. The next person who can't, can, can't restrain themselves. I apologize to the member for Waterloo who has the floor. Start the clock. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, back to the Premier. When the accountability group Polymeter added it all up, the PCs only kept 37 per cent of their promises. Uh, and the budget's very, very late this year. Uh, but that didn't stop the PCs from again breaking your own accountability promise to issue the Premier and the Finance Minister a penalty for a late budget. You said you would be different than the Liberals. Uh, they failed to deliver a budget on time, and, Speaker, this has real consequences for the the agencies delivering services. You are doing the exact same thing as the previous Liberal government by dropping a budget today and then going on tour. It will essentially be a work of fiction. Speaker, instead of bringing in the tax cut in the third year of this government, the PCs, uh, the PCs uh, over the last four years, they have cut services to health care, to education. You froze the minimum wage. You took $6,000 out of the pockets of the people of this province. Why was this three Year tax cut, just one more of the promises that this government failed to keep. And how can you look in the eyes of the people of this province and say you are on their side when you clearly are not? Stop the clock again. Okay. Okay. I'm going to ask the members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor. I'm going to call the Minister of Labour to order. Start the clock. The response, Government House Leader. Speaker, the, the NDP have already said that they would vote against the budget anyway. They haven't even read it or heard it, and they already said that they would vote against it. But you know whose eyes I look into, Mr. Speaker? I look into the eyes of the five, over 500,000 people in this province who have the dignity of a job because of the work that the caucus behind me has done, Mr. Speaker. That's whose eyes I look into, Mr. Speaker, because when we came to office, the Liberals, supported by this gang of, of members here, had decimated the economy. We needed to reignite the economy, and that is exactly what we have done. We are seeing jobs and investment come back to the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, like never before. The engine of the Ontario economy is humming. The engine of Confederation is humming. This is the best place to live, work, invest, and raise a family, Mr. Speaker, and we are going to continue the job because that's what a strong, stable, progressive, conservative majority government delivers for the people of the province Spons. of Ontario. Stop the call. Stop the call. Member for York Centre, come to order. Member for Scarborough Guildwood, come to order. The member for Windsor West, come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Perry Sound, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. After 15 years of inaction under the previous Liberal government, our government is correcting their costly mistakes. That starts with getting shovels in the ground on critical infrastructure projects. Here, here, right. I know the minister is working hard to address gridlock in our province. Could she please tell us how the Bradford bypass will benefit the people of Ontario? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for Perry, Ma Perry Sound Muskoka for the question. Speaker, under the leadership of our Premier, our government is getting it done and building the Bradford Bypass. Major highways are quickly filling up, and as the region's population continues to grow, it only makes sense to get building. The need for the Bradford Bypass was first identified at least 30 years ago, and it was championed by my predecessor, Julia Monroe, for over two decades in this House. Today, that need has only become more urgent. 
Year after year, past Liberal governments have refused to invest in critical infrastructure, and drivers across this province suffer the consequences of their inaction each and every day. Speaker, decades of growing gridlock on the 400 and the 404 have hurt the GTA and made life harder for businesses and for farmers, too. But the benefits of the project Response. go even further, Speaker. We expect the project to generate hundreds of millions of dollars in annual real GDP and support more than 2,600 jobs on average each year during construction. I am so pleased with the support we've had, but, Mr. Speaker, the members opposite continue to say no. The supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. As the minister said, the need for the Bradford Bypass was identified at least 30 years ago, and today gridlock has become inescapable. I have to say the bottom of Highway 400 has among the worst gridlock anywhere. This is the cost of the Liberals endlessly saying no to investing in much-needed infrastructure. Of course, I won't be driving to Toronto nearly as often, but I know that taking the Bradford Bypass to the Highway 2404 and the DVP will take time off the trip for anyone coming down the 400 into Toronto. Could the minister tell us how the Bradford Bypass fits into the government's broader plan to fight gridlock? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the question. Speaker, there is no one-size-fits-all approach to fighting gridlock. Our government is making historic investments in transit, in roads, highways and bridges, and we're getting shovels in the ground faster than any government that has come before us. Speaker, that's because our government is getting it done. Our plans to expand public transit and road infrastructure will provide more travel options for, travel options for people, making it easier and quicker for them to get from point A to point B. And as we build Ontario's transportation network, we are building Ontario's economy too, creating good paying jobs and spurring growth in every corner of this province. And this is what, speak what progress looks like, Speaker. And that's despite the best efforts of the members on the other side of this House, who will keep trying to block all of this good work. We are forging ahead, Speaker, and we are building the Bradford Bypass. Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Not only did this Premier break his election promise to fix the Ontario Autism Program, he destroyed it. And then he and his government spent years fighting with families that just needed help for their children. There are now 50,000 children stuck on a wait list for these services, waiting years <clears throat> years while their developmental potential slips away. Families are tired. They are tired of this Premier's broken promises. They are tired of their failures. Why should any family trust this government when the Premier is clearly incapable and unwilling to help children with autism? Response, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the opportunity to clarify the, the realities. We have 40,000 children who are receiving services through the OAP right now. We have doubled the funding, uh, larger amounts than any previous government ever before. And the pre previous Order. government created a program that children, the majority of children, would never have been able to receive access. We have created a program that was created by the community for the community. It is needs-based. It is more comprehensive than any ever before, including uh, occupational therapy, language and, and speech therapies, uh, mental health support, and we have created an uh, independent intake organization called the Access OAP, which is now beginning to take more and more children in uh, as I speak. And so to the, to the member opposite and Mr. Speaker, I suggest that it's our government that Spons. is fixing a system that was broken from the beginning and serving our children who are in need and our families in need. Thank you. Member for Hamilton Mountain come to Member for Scarborough Gildred, come to order. Member for Davenport, supplementary. Revisionist history. <laughs> the Premier broke his promise to fix the autism program. That's a fact. And tens of thousands of children and families are right now paying this price. Mr. Speaker, from North Bay to Windsor to Ottawa to right here in Toronto, the wait list is growing and growing. 
thousands of children are losing that very precious window of time where therapy helps the most. By gutting that program instead of fixing it, this government, this government chose to send thousands of families into crisis. We remember, it's happening now. Mr. Speaker, families have given up on this government, but they know that New Democrats, we have their backs. Why did the Premier Order. break his promise to families and families of children with autism? And does he even feel a shred of remorse? Side come to order. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. The fact is that our government is serving almost five times as many children in this program. The opposition had the chance to support children and youth with special needs, including autism, and they said no. They said no to the children who will be served by the Grandview Children's Treatment Centre in Ajax. They said no to the children who will be served at the Chatham-Kent Children's Treatment Centre and their families. They said no to the children who will be served Mountain, by the Wonder for Care at Chios Integrated Treatment Centre. They said no and voted against the largest investment to support children with special needs, including autism, in two decades, and they voted against these investments not once, but in two budgets. Our government is supporting children with special needs, including children with autism. It's why we doubled the OAP, the OAP budget, and we will continue the important work that we've been doing over the last few years to make sure that children in these vulnerable situations with their families get the support they need. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. Member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Since the beginning of the pandemic, Ontarians have seen the undermining of the democratic process by your government that outsources decisions to unelected officials and bureaucrats. Premier, democracy only works when elected public servants who represent their constituents. Sadly, the government has lost its way. This is a paramount to a functioning democracy. On September 1, 2021, Speaker, Dr. Nancy Whitmore issued a notice to professions regarding vaccination exemptions. Doctors were flooded with patients who felt they, for medical reasons, could not take the gene therapy. Doctors were banned from writing medical exemptions, notwithstanding their expert medical opinions, understanding that the CPSO had banned them from doing so. Critical to note that doctors are legally bound to uphold consent requirements. Doctors were forced to ignore the legally voluntary consent requirements when patients presented Question. under coercion from their employer. So, Premier, will your government reverse this decision and allow doctors, who know better than government and bureaucrats, to issue exemptions for patients deemed to be at risk? Government House Leader. Speaker, I think the first part of his question is actually more important than the, than the second part. He talked about democracy. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me just say, I might disagree with a lot of members, including that member over there, but this place has been working right through the pandemic. Even when the opposition said that we shouldn't be here, this Premier said we're coming back in the summer. You remember, colleagues, we came back in the summer 2020, 2021, and we got things done for the people of the province of Ontario. This is one of the only legislatures, this is one of the only legislatures that continued to meet in person, Mr. Speaker, that they continued to allow the votes of its representatives right here. We continued on committees, Mr. Speaker. It is because of the hard work, of course, of the professionals who help us run this place, but I am very proud of the progress that we have made. Over what? Close to 80 bills. Yes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that were passed by this government, countless number of private members' Response. bills that were passed. Speaker, I'm really proud of the work that this parliament has done, even if I disagree always with the member opposite and those members as well, Mr. Speaker. Member for York Centre, come to order. Member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas, come to order. The member for Chatham-Kent Leamington, supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Well, I'm not surprised that the government house leader would actually uh, uh, disagree with me. I'm not, I'm not surprised at that at all. But back to the Premier. Patients must always be free to either give consent to or refuse treatment without co duress or coercion. Anything other than that may be deemed no consent at all and therefore may be successfully repudiated. Dr. Whitmer's exemption policy has led to the suspension of Ontario doctors and court actions against them for simply practicing the legal medical ethics they are bound to. Dr. Moore noted back in October of 2021 that the number of exemptions were too high. Well, a family doctor knows what's best for their patient, not an unelected official. If you're going to mandate anything, mandate personal choice. 
Don't play the game of exemptions are too high and don't strong arm doctors by threats of risk of losing their license to practice medicine. The Hippocratic oath of do no harm Question. is being ignored. So, Premier, how is it that CPSO demands Ontario practitioners to forego their legal obligations, medical ethics, and oaths when these are basic principles of the relationship of trust between patient and practitioner? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Of course, it is the advice of medical professionals that we have been taking since the start of the pandemic, uh, Speaker. Uh, that is what we have. That is what has guided us the entire time, uh, Speaker, and that is why Ontario has had uh, uh, better results in combating COVID uh, COVID nineteen than almost any other jurisdiction. We have one of the highest vaccination rates in the world, Mr. Speaker. One of the highest vaccination rates in the world. I am very proud of that, Speaker. It is because of the policies of this government we are seeing jobs and investment and opportunity come back to Ontario. People can look at other jurisdictions and they're saying, we want to be here in the province of Ontario. Why? Because the government has made investments in health care, because we've eliminated red tape, because we're building transit and transportation. We're cutting red tape, Speaker. And despite the pandemic, we have grown the economy with over 500,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker. Over 500,000 jobs. That is what we continue to be focused on, Mr. Speaker, while we fight COVID-19 and hopefully put it in the rearview mirror, Mr. Speaker. We are going to continue to build a strong economy for all of the people of the province of Ontario. Next question, the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. For years, residents in Scarborough have hoped to be better linked to transit that will get them where they need to go. True. That's why I was excited when our government announced support for the Scarborough subway extension. The extension would finally enable Scarborough riders from vibrant communities in Agent Court, North Scarborough, Gilwood, and West Rouge to connect more easily to Toronto's rapid transit system. Speaker, the GTA is world-class urban metropolis, but we do not have world-class transit because the Liberals twiddled their thumbs for 15 years. The last four years of which involved the, the Del Duca when Liberals building zero transformation, transformational transit projects. Speaker, Question. I know this government is finally getting it done. Can the Associate Minister of Transportation please tell this House about the government's progress on the Scarborough subway extension? Thank you. The Associate Minister of Transportation, TCA. Thank you, Speaker. That member deserves a lot of credit because his hard work is paying off for the people of Scarborough. We recently issued a request for uh, proposals to three qualified teams for the design and delivery of station rail and systems work on the subway extension in Scarborough. This is a crucial milestone, Speaker, for the three-stop extension, bringing reliable, modern transit to the communities in Scarborough. This extension will create approximately 3,000 jobs annually during construction, attract 105,000 daily boardings, and cut 10,000 tonnes of auto-related emissions per year. What's more, Speaker, the extension will make it easier to get in and out of the downtown core, all while replacing an aging Line 3 with subway service that will be more reliable and provide greater capacity. Speaker, for 15 years, the NDP Liberal Coalition said no to the people of Scarborough, no for them to get from point A to point B. Well, Speaker, with our $28.5 billion GTA Response. transit plan, the largest transit expansion in Canadian history, we're finally getting it done for the great people of Scarborough and beyond. The supplementary question. Thank you to the Associate Minister for your response and for this terrific, terrific news for the people of Scarborough. Speaker, with construction underway on the Scarborough subway extension, I cannot wait to see this project come to life because it will be yet another invaluable asset to riders. People will finally be able to commute more quickly from Scarborough to the downtown core to work and then back home to their loved ones. Despite this, Speaker, the Liberals and the NDP have again and again and again stood against this government's historic plans for transit. How can Ontarians believe the Liberals or the NDP are serious about building transit? 
with the GTA's booming population, we cannot afford to delay any longer. So, Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain what would happen if we moved backward on transit and how this government's historic transit plans will benefit the people of Ontario? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. It's important to remember that when the Del Duca Wynn Liberals were in power, propped up by the NDP, they found every reason to say no to expanding transit. Speaker, they waited until their last week in office, in fact, to put pen to paper on the Young North subway extension. They made a mess of the crosstown, and they wanted the Up Express to operate as a relief line to downtown instead of actually building a true relief line in the first place. Plus, when in office, Speaker, the Del Duca Win Liberals voted against the Scarborough subway extension, including the Liberal member from Scarborough Guildwood, and this project benefits her constituents. But even after we took uh, office, Speaker, the NDP and the Liberals voted against all four of our subway projects and said no to building these projects faster Order. by building against the voting against the Building Transit Fast Track. Well, Speaker. I think it's important for the people of Ontario to remember, with an election coming, the Liberals and NDP will Response. always say no to transit when our government is actually building the Ontario Line, the Young North Extension, the Crosstown West Extension, and the Scarborough Subway Extension, because we are— Thank you. Thank you. Right, stop the clock. Stop the clock. The member for York Centre will come to order. The member for Scarborough Guildwood will come to order. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. There are a large number of government members. I ask the government side to come to order. Okay. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. This government promised to address the housing crisis, but just couldn't fix what the Liberals had broken. For renters, that meant keeping rent control in place at the bare minimum. Instead, the PCs broke their promise to maintain this as the status quo and quickly exempted all new rental units, allowing for huge rent increases year to year without any way of stopping them. Speaker, this means that in Toronto alone, one in four or roughly 650,000 people are struggling to pay the high cost of rent. That is 140,000 more than in 2018 when the PCs were elected. Across Ontario, the average cost of rent increased by $192 a month, Speaker. Wow. It's a crisis for folks in every corner of our province. My question is back to the Premier. Why did the PCs, the Conservative question. government, break their promise to keep the status quo on rent control? Why would they rip rent control out from underneath Ontarians who need it the most? Good Thank the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Speaker, I'll take this opportunity to correct the, the member opposite. Good idea. Uh, our government, in our fall economic statement in 2018, made good on our promise to protect existing tenants uh, that we made in the 2018 election. But we did a lot more than that, Speaker. We, we put forward a, a variety of reforms through countless pieces of legislation to protect tenants, to strengthen in community housing, to provide our municipal partners with the dollars that they needed in, in, in the midst of a global pandemic to actually build capacity uh, for community housing, to build capacity for supportive housing. You know, uh, this member voted against a, a budget that resulted in policies that created the most rental housing construction in 30 years. How can she stand in this house? When she, when she opposed uh, all of that beautiful construction, 13,000 units last year, uh, in, 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 in this community alone, countless times, this member has stood up, said one thing, and done something different when it came time to vote. Next <laughs> supplementary question. Speaker, 60% of folks in my home of Toronto St. Paul's are renters. They need rent control. For four years, I've heard their fears of being evicted, renovicted, demovicted, and their rent skyrocketing far beyond what they can afford. For too many, this fear created by the PC government has become their reality. These are people who've built their lives and grown their families in St. Paul's, people who've made this place their home for 40-plus years, people on fixed income 
Speaker, seniors. Each of them deserve a roof over their head and to stay in the communities they've built, especially, may I say, during a pandemic. They need real rent control. They needed this government, the Conservatives, to keep their promise, not break it. My question is back to the Premier. How can Ontarians ever trust this government to live up to their next promises? to fix the affordability crisis when we saw how quickly they abandoned their last ones, quote-unquote. Thank you. Speaker. Uh, speaker, I don't know how this member can look her constituents in the eye after she voted against protections to tenants against rent evictions, when she voted against uh, measures that would help uh, tenants and strengthen our community housing system when every single member, including Order. this member and her caucus, when we asked them to join us. Uh, in our call to the federal government for our fair share of, based on core housing needs, based on statistics that she herself have quoted in this House, to get that additional $490 million so we could continue uh, the building that we've been able to do over the last two years. We know, Speaker, that there's much more work to done, but this member and her party consistently have said no. I don't know how they can look their constituents in the eye, Speaker. Next question, the member for Scarborough Gilbert. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. On March the 11th, 2020, I stood in this legislature and asked your government to protect long-term care, to take the lessons from SARS and restrict access to long-term care facilities as a first step to prevent the transmission of COVID-19, to protect our most vulnerable seniors. Unfortunately, your government did not heed my warnings, and the inaction contributed to the loss of loved ones as they got sick in homes in Scarborough and across Ontario. The pandemic was a wake-up call that cannot be ignored. We are now at a moment where action is needed, just as March 11th was, and we need to guarantee home care for anyone who needs it and end for-profit long-term care in Ontario. Speaker, the Ontario Liberals have spoken up in this House and are ready to meet to Question. revolutionize elder care in Ontario. Will the Premier stand with us and right this wrong? Government side, come to order. Government House Leader. Uh, Speaker, I don't even know where to begin on that. Listen, the, the lessons of the pandemic, it's the lessons of SARS that the members should have learned, Mr. Speaker. That's why when they came to office 15 years ago, they should have invested in long-term care. Instead, they built 611 beds. Well, we're building 58,000 new and upgraded beds, Mr. Speaker. We're getting the job done. They could have increased staffing. They didn't, Mr. Speaker. But look, you know what it reminds Order. me of, Speaker? You'll probably remember in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a song by a guy named Shaggy. <laughs> and he went, it wasn't me. Destroying long-term care, although Stephen Del Duca sat at the cabinet table, wasn't him. Not fixing health care, wasn't Stephen Del Duca, Mr. Speaker. But you know what? We'll get the job done for the people of the province of Ontario because people in long-term care deserve it and the people in the province. I, I couldn't hear the government house leader, even though he's speaking audibly, because there's so much going on on both sides of the house. So the house has to come to order. Restart the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and back to the Premier. My riding of Scarborough Guildwood was the hardest hit in this pandemic. The tragic number of seniors lost and the pain that their families and loved ones went through and are still going through, it particularly in long-term care, demands action today. What was done by past Liberal, Conservative and NDP governments is no longer a cover for inaction today. The Ontario Liberal plan to revolutionize elder care in Ontario will build 30,000 new long-term care spaces and modernize 28,000 existing spaces with a focus on smaller community-based homes. We will guarantee home care for anyone who needs it, and we will end for-profit long-term care in Ontario. We will guarantee $25 an hour to PSWs and repeal the wage capping Bill 124 and sections of Bill 106, Question. which gutted the pay 
Equity Act. Speaker, Ontario Liberals believe in investing in our seniors and in elder care. Why is this Ford government determined to focus on the privatization of care and their for-profit donors on the eve of an election? On the eve of an election, we've been at this since day one. They're going to build 58,000. They said, well, guess what? We've already actually done it, Mr. Speaker, in the province of Ontario. It's been the focus of the government right from the beginning, including in her own riding. I announced a Order. brand new upgraded facility in her own riding, Mr. Speaker. She voted against it. She's also voted against the 27,000 additional health care workers, Speaker, and the, and the four hours of care voted against it. But you know, Speaker, we've all been here. You know, sometimes you, you break up with somebody, right? Yeah, yeah. And you always start, it's not, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> but for Stephen Del Duca, it's the other way around. It's not him, it's you. <laughs> Losing jobs, it wasn't me, although I said at the cabinet table, Stephen Del Duca says, it was actually you. Not fixing long-term care, although Stephen Del Duca sat at the cabinet table, it wasn't him, it was you, Mr. Speaker. The people of the province of Ontario know that when it comes to getting the job done, a strong, stable, progressive, conservative majority. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Okay. Okay. The member for Windsor West will come to order. The member for Scarborough Guildwood will come to order. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing will come to order. The Minister of Energy will come to order. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing Pembroke, will come to order. And the Minister of Labour will come to order. <laughs> Thank you. Let's start the clock. The member for Brampton West. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, uh, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. For decades, successive Liberal governments refused to invest in badly needed infrastructure. Stephen Del Duca and the Liberals knew that massive population growth was coming to the GTHA. They knew that our major highways were quickly reaching capacity. They knew that gridlock was only getting worse. And what did they choose to do about it? Mr. Speaker, nothing. So my question to the Minister of Transportation is, can she please tell us what this government is doing to tackle the gridlock crisis that the Liberals let fester for so long? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Brampton West for the question. Speaker, I'm so proud that our government is doing what the Liberals failed to do. We're getting it done for the people of Ontario, and we're building Highway 413. This highway will cut commute times for GTA drivers by 30 minutes each way. This could be the difference between sitting in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic or sitting at home at dinner with your family. But, Speaker, this highway offers so much more than just relief from gridlock. It will support more than 3,500 jobs on average each year during construction, and it will generate up to $350 million in annual real GDP. Yet all we hear from the Liberals and the NDP, Speaker, is no to building it, no to jobs, and no to growth. Members on that side of the House, Speaker, will tell you that they have to, we have to choose between highways and transit. Speaker, that simply isn't true, because our government is saying yes to both, and we'll get it done. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response. Mr. Speaker, the NDP and Liberals have demonstrated time and time again that they are opposed to new highways. All we hear from them is no all the time. They say no to building Highway 413. But as the Minister rightfully pointed out, the Highway 413 project Order. is so much more than just a new highway. So can the Minister please elaborate on what we are doing differently from the last Liberal government? Here, here. The member for Hamilton Mountain come to order. The member for Ottawa South come to order. The Minister of Transportation can reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Speaker, Stephen Del Duca and the Liberals could have addressed gridlock by building Highway 413. Instead, they found every reason to say no, keeping drivers stalled in endless hours of bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic that all of us know all too well. Every single day, Ontarians are paying the price for Liberal inaction, which the NDP supported year after year. But, Speaker, 
I want to reassure everyone that on this side of the House, we will not be repeating the mistakes of the Liberal government. We are saying yes to building Highway 413. GTA drivers are tired of wasting their precious time stuck behind the wheel, and frankly, Speaker, they deserve better. We know that the Liberals and the NDP will do everything in their power to stop this critical project from getting built. But our government will not Response. let that happen, Speaker. We are getting it done. A member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Let's take a walk down memory lane. Instead of lowering car insurance rates and making life more affordable, the Conservative government, just like the Liberals before them, helped their friends in the insurance industry to rip off Ontarians. Every single year that they've been in power, they've approved increases to car insurance. They even allowed billion-dollar car insurance companies to discriminate against Ontarians and charge them higher rates based on where they live. So will the Conservative government finally admit once and for all that they failed Ontarians, they broke their promise, and they refused to lower car insurance rates? Well, I'm sure the people uh, in his riding are very grateful for the fact that, under our watch, insurance rates have actually come down in Brampton, uh, Mr. Speaker. But, but I, I'm with him, though. I'm with him. Let's, colleagues, take a walk down memory lane, shall we? Let's take it all the way back to 2011, when the NDP had the balance of power and could have forced the Liberals to build a brand new hospital in Brampton. Did they? No. no. Let's go back down to memory lane again. They could have ensured that there was greater GO Transit service in Brampton, did they? No. no. They could have ensured that the 413 was built so that the people in this community could get home better and there could be more investments. Did he? No. no. He could have lowered taxes for the people of Brampton, did he? No. I love going down memory lane because I know that when I look back at the last four years, I've got trains being built, I've got subways, I've got jobs and economic activity, I've got a brand new hospital thanks to the President of the Treasury Board, thanks to the Parliamentary Pops. Assistant to Infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. I know that Brampton has a new medical school, and the only thing I can say is that he voted against every single one of those measures. The order, the government side come to order. Supplementary question. Back to the Premier. And on the subject of broken promises, for 15 years, the Liberal government underfunded Brampton's health care, creating a crisis. But instead of making things better, the Conservatives have made it worse. The Conservatives have voted no to fully funding Brampton Civic, our city's only hospital. They voted no to building a second hospital with an emergency room. They voted no to building a third hospital in Brampton. The Conservative Minister of Health herself admitted that she doesn't even believe that Brampton deserves three hospitals. So will the Conservative government finally admit once and for all that they failed Brampton and they failed to end our health care crisis? Municipal Affairs and Housing come to order. To reply on behalf of the government, the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the past four years, there has been no government that has invested more in Brampton than the government of Premier Doug Ford. Here, 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 here. Mr. Speaker, this means a new hospital for the city of Brampton with over 250 beds and a 24-7 emergency room. Wow. Mr. Speaker, the members voted no to that. Mr. Speaker, this means a new medical school, Ryerson Medical School, right in the city wow. of Brampton, Mr. Speaker. Wow. Unfortunately, the members opposite voted no to that. Mr. Speaker, this means building over 600 new long-term care beds in the city of Brampton. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, the members opposite said no to that. And Mr. Speaker, to addressing transportation needs, critical infrastructure, we're building Highway 413. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, that means over 3,500 good-paying jobs during Fox? construction and over $350 million of GDP for the region, wow. Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, the members opposite have voted no to that. Why? The people of Brampton will support this government and our record investments yeah. to support yeah. Stop the clock. Member for Niagara Falls, come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Cambridge. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Premier. Recently, the Premier stated at a Chamber of Commerce event that government should create the environment where business thrives and not be in the business of creating jobs. But once again, the rhetoric of the government doesn't match the policies of this government. For the last four years, manufacturing jobs have drastically been lost in Ontario under this government. And for the last few weeks, this government has been promising Order. over $10 billion in new spending, with hundreds of millions of dollars in promises being made every single day. Included in those spending promises are hundreds of millions of dollars being promised to mega corporations. To do what? Exactly what the Premier says government should not do. Create jobs dependent on government funding. What is the government's plan to create the environment to grow Ontario's economy that does not include billions of dollars in government spending? Or Mr. Energy, come to order. To reply on behalf of the government, Minister of the Environment, or Minister of uh, Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you very much. You know, Speaker, when we first took office and we saw the devastation of 300,000 jobs that had left Ontario, Premier Ford asked us to put together a plan, and our caucus put together a plan that lowered the cost of doing business by $7 billion annually, by reducing WSIB premiums by $2.5 billion, by putting in an accelerated capital cost, which lets business write off their expenses, in their machinery in the first year, a billion dollar savings. We saved $7 billion, and what did that do? It put 500 thousand people to work in our first term. 300,000 before the pandemic and 200,000 men and women went to a job for the first time since the pandemic. Speaker, 500,000 jobs have been created because we've created the climate. We've created that whole spirit of Ontario that the Premier talks about every day. Yeah. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. There are two things that are consistent about this government. The rhetoric never matches the policies, and this government has simply copied the philosophy of the Liberal government that preceded it. After four years, this government has, has not kept one single promise it made with regards to taxes or Ontario's economy, including failing to reduce electricity rates. Rates have gone up. Failing to reduce annual deficit spending. We have seen the largest deficit spending ever failing to reduce taxes. Taxes actually went up when this government implemented an industrial carbon tax and failing Ontario's manufacturing sector with hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs lost over the last four years. Based on its track record, can this government tell us why Ontarians should believe that the government has any interest in deliver delivering any promises it makes over the next 30 days, starting with today's fiscal projections? Minister of Economic Development. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I can tell you that when we got elected, we promised we would turn this economy around, and Speaker, that is exactly what happened in the province of Ontario. We saw an auto sector, thanks to the Liberals, backed by the NDP, that was in decline and ready to leave Ontario. In fact, some did leave Ontario, and we stood up and brought $7 billion in lowering the cost of doing business. And Ford, General Motors, Stellantis, Honda and Toyota all have made multi-billion dollar investments. In fact, in the last 17 months, Speaker, there's been $12 billion, unprecedented in the history of Ontario, $12 billion of new investment. 2,500 men and women are going to go to a job at the Stellantis plant in Windsor where they're going to make batteries for the first time ever in the history of Canada. We'll be making them right here in Ontario, all because we've lowered the cost of doing business and su supplied the climate for businesses to want to come here, and they're coming here by droves. Yeah. Yeah. Stop the clock. <laughs> Order. The member for York Centre will come to order. Order. Start the clock. The next question, member for York Southwestern. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. My riding of York Southwestern is home to many frontline and essential workers, those some workers that put their health and their families' health on the line as they helped carry us through the pandemic, delivering the goods, services, education, and health care we too often take for granted. 
Far too many of these workers are doing low wage and part time work with no benefits. The reality of one person working three part time jobs to feed their family is nothing to be proud of, especially when this government promised to make things better. Where is the plan from this government to raise wages and address the serious situation of part time work being the norm in corporate Ontario? Mr. Speaker. Reply, the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud uh, that our government is working for workers every single day. Mr. Speaker, everything that we're doing is about ensuring that workers in Ontario have bigger paychecks, more take home pay to support themselves and their families, to improve workplace protections and health and safety on the job, but also, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that every worker in this province has an opportunity. Uh, for better employment and for better jobs. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say for the first time in the history of Ontario, we're launching Better Jobs Ontario. We're ensuring that people on social assistance, the 834,000 people today that aren't working in this province, are going to have up to $28,000 per year uh, to get training for bigger paychecks to support themselves and their families. I think, Mr. Speaker, of the work that we're doing to be the very first place Fonts. in North America to ensure that every worker in Ontario has benefits uh, like health and dental uh, and vision benefits, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue working for workers. Thank you very much. We're going to have a paid sick days. Back to the Premier. Another critical issue in York Southwestern has been a lack of support for small businesses. I have heard from countless family owned businesses telling of their frustration with the Small Business Grant Relief Program. These owners have dealt with significant delays in getting approved and lack of communication in general. When the Auditor General reported this government delivering millions of dollars of ineligible businesses, this government shrugged this off and declared no interest in collecting $210 million in money that was wrongly allocated. The government promised to make things easier for small businesses, but they broke that promise, Mr. Speaker. Through you, how does this government think the gross mismanagement of the Small Business Grant Program is acceptable at all, any way, to run a government, let alone a business, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Labour. Well, Mr. Speaker, again, uh, every single day we're building a stronger province for our small businesses and for our workers and families in every corner uh, of this province. Mr. Speaker, I think about the thousands and thousands of small businesses uh, today that's going to be receiving uh, uh, reimbursements and rebates from the WSIB. Mr. Speaker, $1.5 billion is going back to small businesses, uh, small businesses across the province. They're going to invest in their people, grow their businesses, create uh, more jobs. But, Mr. Speaker, we're working for workers as well. We're ensuring that we're recognizing international credentials to become the first province in Canada to ensure that our immigrants are working in professions that they've studied so they have bigger paychecks to support themselves and their families. We've become the first place uh, in North America to ensure that uh, when workers go home at the end of the day, they can disconnect from work. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we're ensuring that uh, workers from other provinces can come here and start work tomorrow to ensure that we're filling labour shortages. We're going to continue working for our small businesses and workers every day. Yeah. Next question, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. President, ce premier ministre is uh, This Premier and this government not held uh, the uh, PSWs. They created a new category of workers, uh, the resident support aides uh, that the long term homes uh, will use to reduce salaries. The lack of personnel in long term care homes its a serious problem. And new, we, the Liberals of Ontario, will have supplements to uh, fulfill the lack of workers and to ensure a stable income in home care and community care, long-term care and hospitals. The uh, Premier, can he explain why he does not to resolve the situation and what does he think that an increase of $3 an hour is acceptable in these circumstances? The government has to respond. It's not true. As you know, we did a lot of investments. We increased 
of 27,000 new workers in this sector. The Liberals voted against that initiative, Mr. Speaker. We know that we had to rebuild long-term care. We knew that right from the beginning. In fact, before the campaign started, we knew that we had to get beyond the 611 beds that the Liberals voted. And you know what their promise was in 2018? You know what they promised to do? Maybe build 5,000 if they got re-elected. 5,000. Well, thank you very much. We're building 58,000 new long-term care beds, Mr. Speaker, and we know that we have to do more, and that's why we're adding 27,000 additional health care workers to get to four hours of care, something that they refuse to do, would never do, Mr. Response. Speaker. And they, all, and they also voted against the pay increases for our PSWs, Mr. Speaker. Shame. We'll get the job done because that's what a strong, stable, progressive conservative majority does. The supplementary question. Well, the recycled lines from uh, Stephen Harper are resuscitated. Um, Mr. Speaker, the Premier keeps saying, let's get it done. Well, here is something he did get done. Long-term care home residents made up 64.5 percent of all COVID deaths during Ontario's first and second waves, the highest in Canada and the OECD. And instead of building an iron ring around them like he promised, he built an iron ring around negligent long-term care home owners to protect them from getting sued. If that's not enough, the Premier tossed out empty words that personal Personal support workers are heroes, and he's now promising an insulting $3 an hour raise and other Band-Aid solutions just to get past this election. Then we have Bill 124 that tells PSWs, nurses and healthcare workers that no, they're not worth anything more than 1%. So Mr. Speaker, if this government is serious about treating them like heroes, will they do what we here are promising, raise PSW base pay to at least $25 an hour and provide mental health supports for all health professionals? Nice leader, Minister of Long -term Care. Thank you, Speaker. She's she spoke about Stephen Harper lines now. She, you know, when she worked for the Stephen Harper government, she helped write some of those lines, but I, I, I digress, Mr. Speaker. I digress. Uh, uh, look, Mr. Speaker, we were actually, the Minister of Francophone Affairs was actually in the member's own riding announcing new long term care allocation. In the member's own riding, I think over 120 uh, uh, beds, something that they didn't do. She calls a pay increase insulting. Imagine how insulted those same hard working PSWs must have been when over 15 years the Liberals ignored them. Ignored them. Now the member for Ottawa South is hollering, oh, it's temporary. He voted against even any, anything whatsoever. And in, in over 15 years, four mandates, what did they do? Nothing. Nothing, Mr. Speaker. If only they had that fifth mandate, they might have done it, Mr. Speaker. But look. Speaker, a strong, stable, progressive, conservative majority government is getting the job done in all parts of the province, east, west, north, south, urban and rural, and we'll continue that after June the 2nd. That concludes our question period for this morning. The government house leader, I understand.